the fact that I'm 95% blind, one third of my tongue is shot off, I'm wearing false teeth, my nose is made out of my hip bone, I have to wear a patch on my face. These are lightweight compared to the rage and the anger and the unresolved guilt that everyone here has. Jerry Statmiller is one of two million veterans who fought in Vietnam. Besides their wounds and suspected symptoms of Agent Orange, hundreds of thousands carry around a backpack of emotional problems from that war. Vietnam was a nightmare Americans would rather forget. But in trying to forget, we've alienated the men who were sent there to a war that made them villains rather than heroes. We're the nasty taste the blemish, the scar, we're all the, we're all the bad things of the whole bloody country for the Vietnam conflict. The albatross that we hang around our neck. We can't smell anything but the stench of that rotting bird. The book on Vietnam veterans isn't a happy tale. They're plagued with divorce, unemployment, alcoholism, and drug abuse. Problems that experts only recently have traced to a phenomenon called delayed stress. The psychiatrists in Vietnam at that time really pat themselves on the head because the, the mental breakdown in Vietnam was really quite low compared to other wars, the combat breakdowns. But it backfired on them. Our real war started the day we got back home. For some, the trauma started with a case of culture shock. I came out of the jungle, flew back to the States, processed out, was back on the East Coast, and was in a hamburger joint on the way home, all within about 60 hours, and a couple of people came in from the hamburger joint and said, uh, hey, how'd you like Woodstock? And I went, uh, Woodstock? Uh. <laughs> Not being able to relate to the new order was bad enough, but things got worse when they found out their old friends couldn't relate to them. So they bottled up their troubles, sometimes, until they cracked. I almost tried to kill myself. I, I almost succeeded, Bill knows. I spent 50 days on a psychiatric ward last summer. My former wife and many of my ex-friends, they used to tell me I was, jokingly, they used to tell me I was crazy. And uh, we would laugh it off. Uh, I was voted most friendly in my high school class. And I don't have any friends now. Now I look back on it, and of course I don't remember the first two years I got back, so obviously I wasn't the same person. <coughs> Not um, the same. Anybody else lost uh, a marriage, wife, a job? For all too many <laughs> Vietnam <laughs> veterans, the war was the high point of their lives, and it's been all downhill ever since. It's uh, high excitement. It's totally high excitement, and that's one of my personal problems: is trying to measure life today by that standard and by the responsibility that I enjoyed in, in, the, uh, in that type of a situation, which was extreme. And when you measure life today and what goes on today, uh, nothing just seems that big a deal anymore. It was an orchestrated war. And I feel like you know, I was a victim of that. I was taken advantage of. My, my friends, uh, my, you know, the people that were over there doing what I was doing and people that weren't doing <coughs> what I was doing, we're all just saps. For many Vietnam veterans, coming home meant not only the fear of readjusting to society, but to society's loathing of the war. Their war stories fell on unwelcoming ears. Instead of coming back to a, a brass band and a parade and uh, being able to talk to our families, girlfriends, wives, uh, having some guy buy us a drink, or give us a ride on the old taxi cab or the bus fare or whatever, uh, none of that took place. And so we just had to keep it inside. The politicians called it a war of hearts and minds, and that's just what a lot of veterans left behind, besides their lives. Does anybody right now feel if, at this second, if you were put back in the same situation you were just before you got out, that you couldn't do your job? No. I think everybody here could do it no. right now, like it hasn't stopped, like it's just like it's right here. It's right there, man, and if I close my eyes, I'm going to be back there. It's scary. For them, the war was never really over. They hadn't lost it militarily, but they hadn't won it either. So they just dangled in limbo, growing more bitter as it dragged on. I, I don't know about losing the war, but we never did. And it's that, there's a lot of frustration behind that, that sort of sentiment. 
the failure in Vietnam was <clears throat> the government in hyping the public to give up their sons to keep going over. We aren't bringing up the thing again and a attacking or accusing the American public. We have our anger that's directed possibly toward the Richard Nixons, the Lyndon Johnsons, and we have a lot of self-anger. A few veterans express their anger in bizarre ways that Americans somehow manage to accept, but others cut to the quick of the conscience. I kept my Purple Heart that they gave me in a safety deposit box down at the Bank of America building. And at some point within the first year, I. I went down there, and the man knew I couldn't see that well, but I went to my box and I pulled it out and I took the Purple Heart out and I threw it in the trash can. And he, he said, oh, you, you don't want to throw that away. And I said, yeah, I do. Uh, to me, being wounded for a cause was not what I did. People always say about Vietnam, it wasn't really, it wasn't a real war. <laughs> it would just follow that we aren't real veterans. Here's a man who's been shot, who's been wounded, uh, doing what his country asked him to do, doing what his country demanded of him at that time, and he can sit there and say, I don't feel like a veteran. Boy, the American people got to be ashamed of themselves if that man can't feel like a veteran. We had a horrible air crash here in San Diego. Horrible. And I don't know how much money was generated, how many doctors volunteered their time to counsel the people that worked at the crash sites to help them get over their day of trauma. There's not a person in this room that didn't have their day of trauma every day. For many Vietnam veterans, the problem of post-war trauma is something that veterans' hospitals just aren't equipped to deal with. They say they get the runaround from doctors who don't know what they want or need. What do I want? Compassion and understanding. That is the key. Compassion and understanding are finally being rationed out under a $9 million veterans outreach program that now supports 80 counseling offices around the country. Vietnam veterans also are getting more attention on college campuses where coordinators are starting to focus on needs besides the GI Bill. But it's in group therapy sessions sponsored by the outreach centers that the battle against delayed stress is really taking place. Nobody wants to hear about it anymore. It's old hat and they don't want to listen. You still got this stuff eating away inside of you. You just about give up, man. The beauty of this program is that you can come here and be understood. By others. Not having anybody make any judgments on your number. It's a, it's a very individual get well thing. It's basically self-help and uh, I think that to answer back to that is the reason we're all here is because it works. It feels good. We want to use these groups, uh, these <coughs> sessions, to bring Vietnam to the forefront, put it out in the middle of the floor, kick it around, but then pick up our lives and go on and have some meanings to our lives. Uh, I think one of the things we're just trying to do is get some validity and have people realize that we are back and, you know, validate the fact that we did do a good job and accept that and let's get that out and move on. According to VA counselors, the readjustment of Vietnam veterans is a two-way street. One society must travel halfway down in order to meet them. I'm hoping maybe through this program that they'll realize that they're not sick, they're not crazy. The war was crazy, but they're not. I want the maladjustment aspects cleared up, but I want to see the American mainstream readjusted to some extent into the perspective of the Vietnam veteran, because there's a clarity of vision that's at work here. There's a, a, a very deep understanding of what is important and what isn't that the American people very sorely need. If nothing else, the experience of the Vietnam veteran may serve as a lesson. We've been to hell and back. We're back and hopefully some people will listen to us and maybe we won't have to worry about Afghanistan and Vietnam, I mean, and Iran and places like that. Although counselors fear there's still too little being done for the Vietnam veteran, it may not be too late to save many from lifetimes of frustration. Those involved in the effort say it's worth the cost, and then some. I cry actually every time I have uh, 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 you know, an encounter with, with a bit. They're the most beautiful people that you can find in this world like it. There's no doubt about it. Uh, they are, and we are, because I am one of them, fortunately. <laughs>